Uh, just to confirm, everyone can see the slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name, as Laurie said, is Kyle Reed, and I am currently a graduate student at the tail end of my master's of science degree here at the University of Alberta. My presentation today is titled Exploring the Autism Observation Scale for Infants, Exploring Group Differences and Classification Properties. And the work I'm presenting today is um, stems from the work I've done for my master's thesis. So without further ado, um, let's begin. Uh, if yeah, okay. So um, I just want to give you all a brief overview of what I will be talking about today. First things first, I'm going to quickly go over what autism is. And given that Nick has already talked about this, I'm not going to belabor this point too, too much. Um, from there, I'm going to introduce an early observational measure of autism symptoms called the AOC. Um, I spent a little bit of time talking about how it's been used, at what age we can start seeing autism uh, symptoms appear uh, in infants when we use it. After this, I do a little bit of a pivot. Uh, to set up my later results, which involve machine learning, I wanna give everyone just a bit of a background um, before I really dive into those uh, uh, into that data. Um, in particular, I'm going to be talking um, about how I used machine learning to make statistical models uh, that can later predict autism diagnoses. I have timed this presentation such that we should have a few minutes at the end for questions. And uh, uh, so, yeah. Um, moving forwards, my presentation today is really centered on two main learning objectives. One, how early can we start to detect autism symptoms using early screening data? And two, uh, how well can machine learning models built using 12 month clinical data predict autism diagnosis at three years old? And so my hope is that by the end of the presentation today, um, I will convince you all that one, uh, we can start to detect autism symptoms in children who are as early as 12 months old um, using the AOC. And two, um, though we're not quite there yet in terms of uh, performance for machine learning models, especially those built using 12 month clinical data, we're at least moving in the right direction and improvements are being made. So uh, as a brief recap, autism spectrum disorders or, autism, or ASD um, is a neurodevelopmental condition that is defined by differences or impairments in social communication, the presence of uh, restricted or repetitive behaviors and interests and or atypical responses to sensory input. Now, one thing that I'm sure that many of us here today know about autism is just how variable it is. After all, it is called the autism spectrum for good reason. Um, people with autism can vary tremendously in terms of how their symptoms present. For instance, uh, some people might be quite capable of living independently and living a very fulfilled life, um, while others you know, may require intense around the clock care to have sort of a, a high quality of life as well. Now, one thing that's interesting about autism is that relatively speaking, it's actually pretty common. A uh, recent report published, um, it was later or earlier last year, I should say in 2021, uh, by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the States, um, estimated that the prevalence rate of autism is one in 44. Now, uh, that is just to say just a little over 2%. Now, to put this in context, uh, the current population of Alberta is just a little over uh, 4.5 million. Um, based on this recent CDC statistic, uh, that would mean that there's over 100,000 people in the province who have autism. And I think we can all agree that that's a lot. Uh, now, while this estimate is, the CDC estimate is around 2%, it's important to recognize that uh, this refers to the community prevalence rate of autism. There are some populations who are at increased likelihood or chance of being diagnosed with autism due to factors like having fragile X syndrome, uh, tuber sclerosis complex, being, or being born preterm, or uh, simply being an infant sibling. And what this means to say is that you are an infant sibling of a child who is already diagnosed with autism because there is a significant genetic uh, component with the condition. Now, from a research perspective, studying these increased likelihood populations can actually be really, really handy if you want to study early development or emergence of autism because you simply have more people to study. Now, going back to that CDC statistic, uh, well, 2% to 4.5 million, I think we can all agree is a lot, like over 100,000. If you're conducting a study investigating early autism symptoms in children and recruit, say, only 100 people from the general population, at the end of the day, you might only get like one or two, you know, per hundred uh, um, who end up having a diagnosis. And that can make it really, really challenging from a research perspective because you don't have a lot of participants and you don't have a lot of data. And, and you know, you trying to power statistics with, you know, just one or two or three or four people can be really, really challenging. So in contrast, if you instead focus on studying populations that are at increased chance or likelihood of being diagnosed with ASD, uh, instead of having maybe you know, one or two per hundred, uh, you can get a lot more than that, especially with the same number of participants that you recruit. 
Now, this makes it a lot easier uh, to study because there's simply more people at the end of the day who have the condition, which means there's more participants, you can get more data, and any sort of statistics, or even if you're trying to get observational data or results, um, are a little bit more meaningful just because you have a larger pool to draw from. So instead of, let's say, the 2%, you might have between 15 18% as seen with infant siblings, all the way up to maybe 50% of the uh, uh, participants um, at increased likelihood who have, let's say, fragile X. Now. Uh, moving on from there, I want to just briefly talk about uh, uh, the autism observation scale for infants. And, and this is um, also known as AOC for short, which I'll be using throughout the rest of this presentation. The AOC is a brief 19 item observational measure that was designed to characterize early behavioral signs of autism in increased likelihood infant siblings that are between six and 18 months old. So uh, what does that actually measure though? Um, the AOC was designed to assess multiple overlapping constructs of autism within a short, semi-structured kind of play-based context. Now, uh, these, these early kind of constructs can include aspects of social communication, uh, atypical sensory motor behaviors, emotional regulation, as well as restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. And the really nice thing about the, the AOC is that since it's actually relatively short, it takes about 20 or so minutes to, to complete, um, it can be you know, done or administered relatively quickly. Um, and uh, that's really helpful when you're working with really young populations. So uh, one thing that I kind of want to, to uh, give to you guys, or the information anyway, is that based on how a, a kid scores on the AOC, what we can do is calculate something that's called the AOC total score. And, and this total score is a summary of items 1 to 18 on the scale. And the main takeaway I want you guys to have is that higher scores, higher AOC total scores are indicative of more concerning behaviors with respect to autism related symptoms. And it's not diagnostic, but it's just the higher the score, the sort of maybe the more concerns or the, the, the more flags that we see. So um, how has the AOC actually been used though? So since its initial development in 2005, the AOC has primarily been used in increased likelihood infant siblings. And this isn't a surprise, it was quite literally designed to be used in these populations. Um, but if you look at the timeline on the slide, we can see that all of the red lines, all of those flags indicate some kind of publication that uh, uh, was um, a journal article, a book report, a, a chapter, basically some kind of publication that talks about the AOC. And these were done in-house, which is to say either done by the people who developed the, the AOC um, Autism Research Center uh, sort of staff or affiliates across Canada. And this isn't exhaustive, but um, uh, this sort of gives you an indication of like what some of the research is on it. Now, well, every single one of these publications since it was first published in 2005 um, were done in infant siblings, uh, we're actually starting to see the, the tool being used in, by other research labs and in other you know, populations too. So uh, given the background that I just gave you on the AOC, um, how early can we actually start to detect autism symptoms when we use it? Now, in order to actually tackle this question properly, we first need to get an idea of what research is out there on the AOC. Now, while I showed you that there are several publications you know, put out by the Autism Research Centers across Canada, uh, they're not the only studies that were done. If we wanna actually get a really good answer as to how the AOC has been used, how well it performs, we actually need to do a much more rigorous systematic search through the literature and see how everybody does it or everybody uses it. Now, this led us naturally to doing a systematic review. Now, excuse me, while I don't have the time to really dive deep into my systematic review proper, uh, although with any luck, it should be published hopefully in the next couple of months by the Journal of Neurodevelopmental Disorders. So keep an eye out if you're interested. You can see the Prisma search strategy diagram that we used. And this really was just how we structured our search and what databases that we use. Now for the review itself though, we really focused or honed in on two things. One, assessing how the AOC has been used in published research. So for instance, what populations has it been used in, um, at what ages, things like that. Uh, two, we wanted to look at how well the AOC actually um, could perform. So in other words, how well could it actually accurately identify children who were later diagnosed with autism from those who were not. Now, after conducting a review, we found a bunch of other studies and seen in blue on the, on the timeline um, that use the AOC. And interestingly, not all in infant siblings either. Uh, we found overall that the AOC had been used in four different increased likelihood populations. Now, these include naturally, younger you know, siblings of children formerly diagnosed with ASD, the infant sibs, there's no surprise here. But we've also seen the AOC being used in infants with fragile X syndrome, infants with tuberous sclerosis complex, and uh, there was a recently a study where the AOC was used in infants with Down syndrome too. So once we identified all the studies that actually were included in our review, we wanted to look at how infants, both increased likelihood infants, 
uh, those so those four populations I just mentioned also and also controls um, how they scored on the AOC when it was administered across different ages. Now, one thing that is helpful when interpreting the scatter plot is that the symbols that are white indicate controls or the increased likelihood of populations who are not, not diagnosed. Now, um, while this looks a bit jumbled, uh, I'm going to just sort of direct everyone's attention to the total score data that was taken before 12 months. Now, if we look at the different increased likelihood of populations, so those that had like the, the blue, the yellow, the red, um, there's really no clear pattern that differentiates how these, these uh, uh, sort of populations score. So it's all kind of just jumbled together. The main takeaway from prior to 12 months in terms of AOC total score data is that we don't see, we really don't be able or aren't able to see any sort of group differences between controls um, who do not have autism, increased likelihood infants who do not have autism, and increased likelihood infants who do. There just really isn't a clear pattern um, in this data. Now, if we look at the total score data after 12 months, however, we start to get a very different story. We start to see clear separation between the different increased likelihood groups, as well as the controls. So for instance, the blue squares suddenly start hanging together. We start seeing the white squares and the uh, white diamonds, they all hang together. Uh, the red circles hang together. So uh, things are starting to group up together. Now, um, in particular, we start to see children who are controls that do not have autism score lower than all of the increased likelihood populations who do or do not have autism. Now, we can actually break this down even further. Um, we can see that captured within the gray bubble, these are all of the controls across all of the studies. So again, they're scoring lower than all of the other populations. We can also see, however, infant siblings who are developmentally delayed in, in this yellow circle. Um, we can also see infant siblings who are diagnosed with autism in blue, uh, infants with Down syndrome in purple, and uh, infants with tuberous sclerosis or fragile X in red. Now, I want to take just a quick minute because uh, these results, while you know, easy to interpret on a scatter plot when depicted this way, actually are statistically significant, um, primarily when we're looking at 12-month uh, data on onwards. So we did run a bunch of meta-analyses for the systematic review because it was systematic review and meta-analyses. Um, but for the sake of brevity, I haven't shown them here because it's basically a big wall of, of numbers and uh, tables and stuff like that. So just it's important to consider or just important to note that these differences that we see actually are significant. And so like we ran effect sizes between, um, uh, for instance, infant siblings with ASD relative to those with controls. And we did find that there is a statistical increase in, in um, uh, significant increase, I should say. So uh, now that we've actually learned a little bit about the AOC, I want to switch gears and just give everyone a little bit of background before we start getting into the machine learning results. So since the 1960s, computer performance has roughly doubled every two years. And this is primarily due to advances in technology and computer manufacturing that was lockstep with reduction in cost. And the reason I bring this up is because uh, this has led to an exponential increase in computing power at really reduced cost. Like to give you guys some perspective on this, this is an IBM supercomputer in 1961. It was quite literally the size of a room and uh, it would have cost in today's dollars a cool 28 million. Now, um, if we contrast that to say a MacBook today, uh, I looked at the statistics like, you know, I think it was two days ago and the cost of a 2022 MacBook is between 1500 and $2,000 Canadian. And so that's over 14,000 times cheaper and what is really relevant to this discussion, though, is that uh, it is literally orders of magnitude more powerful. The computers we have today blow everything we had in the past out of the water. And so this exponential increase in computing power has led to actually some really cool things. In particular, the, this increasing accessibility of really powerful devices has led uh, uh, um, us to being, to, or to being able to do things that are in, you know, increasingly you know, um, computationally demanding, which is to say, quite literally, were impossible to do on older hardware. And so some of these things include, you know, using uh, a techniques like machine learning or artificial intelligence to solve different kinds of problems. So this takes us to actually like talking about what machine learning is. Now, machine learning is a sort of a boring definition, is a branch of artificial intelligence and computer science that focuses on, on using data and computer algorithms to imitate the way humans think in order to learn and gradually improve their performance. And now I know that when many people hear machine learning, I have no doubt that many immediately think of uh, this. Um, and uh, in reality, it's actually a lot more mundane. It looks a little bit more like that. Uh, instead of the Terminator, uh, we get a computer that is running some kind of code that can gradually improve its performance as it's executed uh, to solve some sort of problem or find a solution to some kind of question. Now, uh, the thing that uh, about machine learning is it's actually a lot more common than I think many of you might sort of believe it on first glance. Uh, you know when you open up your computer browser or your phone and you get those annoying ads? Um, well, a lot of those advertisements 
are based on an algorithm and, and um, that learns what kind of ads you or people like you uh, actually click on or engage with. And so based on that history, it will recommend different ads to different people because it's trying to get you to engage with it better. Um, when you, for instance, buy something off of Amazon and it's like, oh, hey, we have a recommended new product for you. Uh, that's the same kind of boat. It's based on Amazon has developed machine learning algorithms that based on what people like what you buy, what people like you buy, it will try to recommend things that it think you might be interested or actually engage with. Now, uh, I know when for the, for the people who had long days and, you know, like me, maybe watched a little bit too much Netflix, when you finish a show and, uh, you know, do I really want to watch something else? And Netflix recommends a cool new title. You're like, oh, maybe I'll take a look at that. That's again, sort of a machine learning algorithm that's based on the watch history of you and people like you, um, that it tries to recommend things that you might engage with. The, the real point that I'm trying to drive home here is that machine learning is actually really, really common in the world today. And it's in your everyday life and, and more than you might think. So one major benefit though, to using machine learning in like a data analysis or sort of science approach is that depending on the problem you're trying to solve, it can let you really rapidly evaluate different combinations of variables or factors to sort of see which combination you know, has the best performance or the best results. Now in healthcare settings, machine learning algorithms are frequently being developed to see how well they can function in predictive capacities. And now this can range from things like trying to develop machine learning algorithms that can you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, um, interpret like complex pathology slides. So for instance, when someone goes to a pathologist and you get like a biopsy and it's trying to like say, is this cancerous or not? There's machine learning algorithms, algorithms that have been developed to try and interpret that. But um, what I'm doing and what a lot of sort of healthcare research is doing is trying to uh, uh, predict diagnostic outcomes based on early patient data. Now, currently though, many of the diagnostic uh, learning algorithms that are sort of being developed in sort of a research or healthcare capacity really struggle with achieving high accuracy um, and especially an accuracy that's required for either differential diagnosis or clinical implementation. Now, this segues really nicely to the kind of goal of my machine learning study which is to say, since I discovered on the AOC um, that we can start to really see autism symptoms as early as 12 months old, I wanted to, one, build machine learning models using 12 month clinical data and sort of see if I could predict or develop a predictive model that could uh, uh, identify autism diagnosis three years later or sorry, 36 months. Um, and then two, I wanted to assess how well these machine learning algorithms actually performed. Uh, because if I have a model and it performs poorly, you know, it's real, no real use. So uh, this is what it actually looked like when I was making my predictive models. And uh, this is what I was staring at in R for you know, uh, far too many hours. And I'm going to spare you all this indecency and show you uh, sort of a nice, easy to interpret flow chart because it's much more you know, nice to look at. Um, this is what I did in essence. And so I fed different combinations of 12 month clinical data from the AOC, uh, the Mullen, which is the Mullen scales of early learning. And so this is more of a a general developmental assessment we had data on. And so I wanted to consider it as well, because again, machine learning really, really excels at assessing different combinations of factors together. Um, and then I also considered biological sex. So whether a, a infant was male or female, because there is a significant sex bias in autism diagnostics. It's about four to one currently in, in, in the research. Um, and so uh, what I did is I fed all of this 12 month data into different uh, 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 algorithms. So I looked at logistic regression, I looked at regularized logistic regression, and then three different types of support vector machines using linear polynomial and radial kernels. Now, while the exact details um, are not necessarily relevant to this discussion, um, uh, uh, suffice to say that these are all, you can, you can use all of these in a sort of machine learning capacity. Um, and one of the things that I, think was really interesting, um, at least the way that I structured this, is the data that I fed into each of these algorithms was exactly the same. So um, every single one of these, these algorithms that I tested, the models that I built, were built using the exact same sort of uh, uh, collection of data. So all of the same participants, the same scores. Um, so when I actually went and assessed how these models performed, um, any difference in performance wasn't due to me feeding different data into these, these algorithms. It was based on how the algorithms actually generated a model. And so that was differences within the modeling, not so much the participant data. Now, uh, once I had my machine learning models, uh, I wanted to then assess how good they actually were at predicting 36 month autism diagnostic outcomes. Because again, this is 12 month clinical data, feeding it into statistical model, and then I wanted to predict 36 month outcomes. So what I did is then I assessed all of these algorithms and all the different models that I made against about 500 or so infant siblings uh, in, in terms of participant data. So uh, these are the results in full. Um, now, in the interest of time, because we'd be here a very long time if I wanted to work through all of this, uh, 
I'm going to sort of use uh, just a truncation. So basically the best performing models of, of my study. Um, because again, the astute among you might notice that this is table eight and it's table eight of 12 with two supplemental tables. I have a lot of data, so we don't have time for that. Um, instead, I, I, again, I'm just going to be showing sort of the tool or model um, that I developed, how accurate it was. And so this is basically just a description of how well the model performs at correctly identifying individuals who do and do not have autism. Um, I'm also going to be looking at error under the curve or AUC. And so this is in kind of statistical uh, sort of analyses, it's a, a kind of a measure of how good the test or model is at actually classifying someone with the condition that you're looking at, in this case, autism. Um, now, uh, area under the curve ranges in values between about zero or from 0 0.5 to one. And, and to put it simply, the, you really wanna be as close to one as you possibly can. Because the closer you are to one, the better your tool or model is. You know, an area under the curve of one is, is perfect. And we rarely ever find that, but, but that's really kind of the goal when you're developing these kind of tools or predictive, predictive uh, algorithms. Now, we're also going to be looking at model sensitivity. And so this describes how well a tool is at actually correctly identifying children with autism from those who don't. And then we're going to be looking at specificity. And so this also looks at, um, instead of, or, or this, this looks at, I should say, uh, how well a tool is at correctly identifying children who do not have autism. Um, so uh, it is important to note that while the best clinical or diagnostic tools are both highly sensitive and specific, um, in practice, it's not always feasible. Uh, it, it, it can really also be context dependent on like, what do you prioritize or value? For instance, um, a good example is, is, is talking about HIV diagnostics, so human, human immunodeficiency virus. And so um, if the consequences of, for instance, missing an HIV diagnosis is really high, which it is, you wanna focus on sensitivity. So the test is really, really sensitive. So you ensure that you don't accidentally make a false negative. Now, uh, in the inverse, if the consequence of a false positive are really, really high, so for instance, saying to someone, you know, we think you're HIV positive when they're not, uh, that has some severe psychological implications. And so that's where you want really, really high specificity. And again, ideally, you want both, but it can kind of come down to sort of what you value or what you value more in that kind of context. So um, to give actually a bit of an idea how my tool stacks up or my algorithm stack up to establish literature, um, I wanted just to report the benchmark performance of a tool that many of us in autism research are likely familiar with. And this is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, commonly known as the ADOS. And so the ADOS is widely considered uh, one of the gold standard tools used in autism diagnostics. The ADOS 2 in particular has several modules designed for different ages and expressive language levels. Now, germane to us in this discussion is the ADOS 2 toddler module, which has two algorithms. It has algorithm one, which is meant for uh, children 12 to 20 months old, and algorithm two, which is 21 to 30. Um, I'm only just gonna present algorithm one data because again, that best that's the closest to the algorithms that I developed because all my models were built using 12 month data and this considers 12 to 20. Now, when we look at the ADOS uh, toddler modules performance, we see that it actually has really, really high performance metrics. The, area, the, the accuracy I should say is almost 94%, which is great. Area under the curve is uh, 0.92. So really close to one, it's, it's actually pretty high. Uh, sensitivity is fantastic at 0.98, um, although, and sensitive or specificity, I should say, while not quite as high, is still a solid, you know, 0.75. It's, it's still respectable. Um, when we look at my, uh, uh, the five best performing machine learning models I built, we immediately see that, unfortunately, accuracy ain't quite as high. Uh, instead of the low 90s that we were looking at with the ADOS, we have high 70s, so 76, 77 percent. Um, Area under the curve, unfortunately, was in the same boat. Most of my models had okay-ish area under the curve, um, which have it around 0.7, you know, 3 to 0.76, which is, isn't great, but is horrible. It, it's solidly okay-ish. Um, interestingly, uh, all of my models really had poor sensitivity. They, they really actually struggled with correctly identifying children who did have autism from those who did not. However, uh, specificity was excellent. It, these models were fantastic at correctly identifying children who did not have autism, which was uh, uh, interesting. Uh, to say the least. Now, um, as you guys can see that like the best machine learning models that I built um, can't quite stack up against how a, a established diagnostic tool performs right now. Um, they're still slightly better than previous machine learning models um, that uh, have been used, that have used the AOC. Um, in this case, uh, this data that I've just highlighted here is based on 14 month data. Um, and that was published from a study, uh, Busu 2018. Um, so just a few years back. And so what I kind of want to talk about here is that while we're not there yet, I mean, the models that I built aren't, again, 
commensurate with the, the ADOS in terms of performance, we're actually taking a step in the right direction because the accuracy of my models are like 10% higher than, than uh, Boosted 2018. Um, area under the curve is just a little bit higher instead of 0.71. Um, we're again, mid, mid 0.75, 0.76. Um, their, their model was more sensitive than us, but ours was much, much more specific. So circling back to the learning objectives I had uh, about how early can we start to detect autism symptoms and how well can machine learning models built using 12 month data predict autism diagnosis. My hope is that, you know, so far I have convinced you all that we can start to see autism symptoms as early as 12 months old using the AOC. And two, that we're not quite there yet in terms of performance, the results are promising. And at the very least, we're taking steps in the right direction. So uh, I would like to just take a quick minute. I know we're almost right on time. Just to thank all the families who participated in this research. This would not have been possible without them. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank everyone from the Edmonton Autism Research Center who's helped me get to where I am today. Special shout out to Dr. Sakri, uh, because uh, if she didn't ask me to be here, I would not be presenting today. Um, and finally, uh, I'd also like to thank all of the donors and funders who've helped uh, uh, fund this research because again, I would not have been able to do it without that support. And uh, so this takes me to the end of my presentation. Um, if we don't have, if I can't answer all the questions, my email is on the slide. So feel free to send an email and um, 